let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, we would invite you to turn with us to Romans. To Romans. I know what you see printed in the bulletin, but that's why you bring a Bible. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. If you are physically able, we ask that you would stand for the reading of the Word of God. Romans chapter 8, moving down to verse 35. Romans chapter 8, moving down to verse 35. Romans chapter 8. Say amen when you found it. Amen. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app, look on with your neighbor. If they're being stingy today, say that the preacher said, I can look. We ask and ask that you would flank us with your prayers as when we work on these, we usually work way in advance, uh, but as a result of recent um, events, uh, we thought it was appropriate to go before the Lord and ask the Lord what would be the appropriate word on a day such as today. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? The NIV reads, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Savior. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. I'd like to place a tag upon this text. For constitutes the context of which we attempt to teach and to preach at this moment, we would like to focus on the idea, on the subject of Prophetic grief. Prophetic gr grief. If you could turn to your neighbor at this time, just turn and look at your neighbor, smile at your neighbor. If they're trying to act like they're taking notes, there are no notes to take. <laughs> look at your neighbor. Tap them on the shoulder if they're trying to be real deep. And tell them to give you a piece of that gum they just went and got. <laughs> And say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, he must learn, he must learn. How, to how to grieve prophetically. prophetically. And find another neighbor. <laughs> Maybe the same one. And say, neighbor, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor, 
you need to know, need to know nothing, nothing can separate us, can separate us from, the love of God. from the love of God. Prophetic grief. Prophetic grief. A few days ago, a young man drunk on the wine of Confederate supremacy and high on the ideological opium of racialized thinking attempted to start a race war. This young man who was not alone but was haunted and possessed by the ghosts of the Confederacy and counseled by a Jim Crow consciousness that is echoed today by political party throwers who declare they want to take their country back. This domestic terrorist was unfortunately conceived by America's original sin and our largest exported product, better known as racism. Many have tried to define this moment as an anomaly, but terror and terrorism come in many forms. We have met Dylan Roof before. Our Native American brothers and sisters met his ancient mentors on the Western Plain of America, known as the Trail of Tears. Our ancestors encountered his teachers as they argued across oak tables in Philadelphia and attempted to define Africans as three-fifths of a human being to protect the economic interests of a new republic. Women encountered Dylan Roof, uh, his professors, uh, his professors who claimed female biology was God-ordained evidence of female inferiority. Uh, we met Dylan Roof before Asians met his counselors when forced into concentration camps during World War II. We met Dylan Roof before. We met him in Mississippi when we pulled the bodies of three civil rights workers, one named Goodman, the other named Cheney, the other named Scherner. We met Dylan Roof before. We met him in Birmingham as we sifted through rubble and discovered the body of four little girls. We met Dylan Roof before. We encountered his spirit in Selma when Jimmy Lee Jackson was gunned down with his hands up and faded from this world because he could not breathe. We met Dylan roof before. We met his spirit in the driveway of the Evers household when a young Medgar Evers was gunned down in the back by bullets laced with hate. We met him before in an Oak Creek Sikh temple where freedom and loving people were gunned down just north of this place known as Chicago. We met him before immigrants met his spiritual guide when men yelled with venom, well, with venom to take their country back from dangerous and brown people. We met him before uh, when our brothers and sisters who are LGBT met his advisors when the br brutality, brutality of differing orientation, yes, where people yes. thought that it was a rite of passage for someone to beat someone down because of their orientation, because they were trying to lift up a false masculinity. Terror is not new, and hatred is a disease that diminishes the soul. Dylan Roof sat in a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, watching black, and black women and men sip from a cup drawn from a well that never runs dry. He was misguided. Uh, his misguided, racially inebriated soul was too drunk to recognize amazing grace knocking at his door. Our hearts broke. Our hearts continue to break. Our spirits are cast down into the pit of confusion. How could this happen? Why did this happen? It happened because based on a socially constructed idea called race and racism. Jim Wallace, the founder of the Sojourners Magazine and Community in Washington, D.C., stated this week at a summit where I was with him, and I paraphrase his powerful words. This comes from a person of European descent. He said this will not change until white people refuse to be white. We can never be Christian and white at the same time. White people are only white when black people are present. Once you all leave, we become German, Irish, Swedish, and Anglo. And when you return, we become white once again. Until we break the addiction to privilege, we will never rede be redeemed from America's original sin called racism. 
I believe Jim Wallace was on to something. In moments like these, we must learn to grieve and grieve prophetically. We must learn to grieve the way that Paul taught the church at Rome, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. We must learn prophetic grief. I learn and I lean upon the wisdom of the elder to my left. You, Pop, who were raised in Troop County, Georgia, where the shadow of Jim Crow cast its murky gaze upon all civic activities, you gave your life to a movement, an ideal, and to our God. We lean upon your wisdom today. You who danced with death and dared to sing, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. As men called to serve and protect, protect sought to kill and maim. I concede my time to you as the elder in this room. Tell us about prophetic grief. Thank you for that amazing introduction. You have taught me, and I want to thank you. Prophetic grief is different from pathetic grief. <laughs> pathetic grief is angry, mad, vicious, bitter, always blaming others. And then there's sympathetic grief where we pass out sympathy, but do not necessarily enter into the other person's tragic moment. But then there is prophetic grief, where we stand inside of the other's wounds and hurt and blood and tears and sorrow so deeply that it becomes our own. That is prophetic grief. And uh, the reason we can recommend that kind of grief is because as a people, we have forever matriculated in the college of agony. We, we have been educated in the university of adversity. However, agony alone does not define us. It does not imprison us because we follow the path of righteousness which takes us through agony to a blessed assurance and find everlasting affirmation. Prophetic grief is more than crying and sighing and mourning. It is seeing, seeking, serving and sowing righteous seed in the midst of our tears. Prophetic grief is planting gardens of healing. It is declaring to the world that love is stronger than hate, that God's grace is greater than our grief, that God's power is greater than our pain. Prophetic grief teaches us, and the lessons it teaches, we have seen in Charleston, South Carolina. In, in a horrible massacre, the saints of Charleston gave us lessons in prophetic grief and sacred greatness. But, 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 but 
let me say, we, we've got to juxtapose the who and the what. We have identified the alleged who. We have named him. Uh, the authorities have arrested him and placed a million dollar bond on his head. The who. We, we know the name of the who. We know his age. We know his parents. We've met some of his classmates, the school that he did not finish. We know the who. And, 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 and journalists and commentators have spent a lot of time and will continue to do so dealing with the who. But there's a deeper challenge. And that deeper challenge is not just the who, but what. Now, 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 we do not want to deal with the what. Because that what raises the question, what is it in our nation that causes us to be in love with guns? What causes us to be in this nation the greatest gun buyers and gun sellers and gun traders and gun worshipers. What is it that makes us so committed to gun rights? Some people, I think, Pastor Otis, think that uh, there are only two amendments to the Constitution. Gun rights and states' rights. And uh, these are the people who believe so much in gun rights that they will kill you about gun rights. They don't care much about civil rights. They care even less about human rights. But they will vote all day and all night, they will pass laws to enable more guns. They want a gun in every classroom. They want, as a matter of fact, you told me the other day that this nation is less than 5% of the world's population. And yet, we own in the civilian population 42% of all the guns in the world. This armed nation that's disarmed morally, we must deal with the what. Now, 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 let me hurry on to say that I do not believe that the 21-year-old young brother was born that way. Because there's a difference between nature and nurture. Maybe you don't believe it. But go back to an old song that appeared in a Broadway production years ago that said you've got to be taught before it's too late to hate all the people your relatives hate. Before you are six or seven or eight, you've got to be carefully taught. What kind of lesson are we giving 
to our children? What are we feeding them? What is the diet we are giving to them? What is it that makes people worship guns over God? What is it that causes some people to think that the NRA is the way? They have forgotten if they ever learned that Jesus is the way. Prophetic grief says, I'm hurt, but I found healing. Prophetic grief says, if I knew you and you knew me and each of us could clearly see by inner light divine the meaning of your life and mine, we would differ less and clasp our hands in friendliness. Prophetic grief says weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Prophetic grief says envy not the oppressor and do not copy any of his ways. Prophetic grief says uh, weep not as those who have no hope. Prophetic grief says there is healing. Yeah. There is a message to all of us from, from the sanctuary of Charleston saying, who will separate us from the love of God? Hardship? No. Massacre? No. Lynching? No. no. Confederate flags? No. Persecution? No. Hatred? No. Hatred of our president? No. Disrespect for our first family? No. Voter suppression? No. New Jim Crow? No. Slavery by another name? Prisons for profit? No. Unequal pay for equal work? No. No, in all of these things. Mass murder plus all of the agony will not separate us from the love of God. Now, my time is, is up. Not only that, but my time on earth is almost up. And it's in your hands. And your generation and your children and your children's children to carry on. Tell us what you feel and see and hear and know. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. That it is in the sanctuary of Charleston, a sanctuary that was created out of the crucible of pain known as the South. Black faith is always engaged in prophetic uh, grief. Prophetic grief states that tragedy does not inform my theology, but theology informs my tragedy. We have, as a people, learned how to stare in the abyss and not fall into the pit of despair. The beauty of our faith is that we can sing the blues, yet know the power of the gospel. Yes. The very nature of our faith is carved from the splintered wood of an unfinished democracy. Our faith is not written by Luther, Calvin, Wesley, or the heralds of the Reformation. 
Our faith came of age when strange fruit, fruit was the delicacy of the South. Yeah. Our faith has been and is still powerful because we created our own seminaries and institutions. Yeah. I'm not talking about Howard or ITC or Shaw or Payne. I'm talking about seminaries down by the riverside Three. next to the drinking gourd. I'm talking about a seminary where Sojourner Truth was elected president of the seminary. Howard Thurman became the dean of the chapel. Yeah. Dr. King became the director of justice studies. Malcolm X served as lecturer of black theology. Yeah. We have a faith not birthed in the small hamlets of Europe, but in the souls of displaced Africans who forged a home in the strange land called North America. Those looking on the outside were confounded by the resolve of families who dined in sorrow's kitchen and were forced by the heralds of affliction to lick all the pots clean. Yes. It was Chris Matthews, the celebrated pundit and commentator on MSBC. He was astonished and confounded that these families could look Dylan Roof in the face yes. and say, we forgive you. He said, I've never seen anything like this. Well, these are some really Christian people. I said in my mind, you've never been to a black church. You've never seen black faith. You see, my response is that there's power in our faith. This is not faith where your Jesus is an appendage or a scarf to wrap around your neck. This faith is one that is being, t that your faith is tied to the sacred and your life is tied to the divine. This faith is a faith where miracles are not anomalies, where redemption is not a fairy tale. Deliverance is, not, is more than a descriptive adjective, but an active verb permeating the soul of every believer. This faith is where Tubman learned her freedom. Douglas discovered abolition. Du Bois discovered his intellect. Zora found her literary power. Langston crafted poetic brilliance. Ida B. Wells discovered journalistic integrity. This is the faith where dreams are ignited, visions are made flesh, declarations become edicts of hope, and breathe life into lifeless bodies. The faith of the families of Charleston is the real story. Yeah. Their resolve and prophetic power and deep spirituality is not an anomaly, but the manifestation of Africanity and Christianity joining together to produce a faith that says this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine this type of faith is a, has a soundtrack of amazing grace playing in heavy rotation from the radio station of WSOUL radio. Paul's word, Paul the apostle, the one who was mistaken for an African citizen, pins the words with such fervor to give us what prophetic grief is all about. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Prophetic grief is watching a young black man with his arms around his two sisters. His mother just died, but looking into the camera and saying, I know we are going to make it. Prophetic grief is watching a woman who lost her mother say, my heart does not have space to hate. Prophetic grief is watching people who spent time in church and their parents poured into them and they felt the power of God. This is prophetic grief. Prophetic grief says I forgive you. And this message of Charleston, I do not write any more stories about Dylan Roof. We need stories about Pinckney. We need stories about Middleton. We need stories about nine prayer warriors. Don't write about Roof. No, if you want to learn prophetic grief, you need to look at the people of Charleston as they gather together and say nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not your bullets, not your hate, not your pain, not your anger, not anything you throw at us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I bid you good day. May the Lord bless you real good, but nothing can separate us. Nothing can separate us from the love 
of God. Prophetic grief. God has called God's people to grieve prophetically, not pathetically, but prophetically. The door of this church is open.